welcome to the 96th episode of the Veritas Fact Finding Series. And today, I'm really honored to have Mr. Stephen Polos as our guest. Good morning, Stephen. Good morning. Nice to be here. Surfacing facts and revealing truths is a never-ending quest for us at Veritas. In each episode of our Fact Finding Series, we go on the ground to speak to industry professionals in an unscripted, candid video format to discover how we can make better investment decisions. In this series, and with everything we do, we believe the truth comes from the facts and that better, invest, better information leads to better investment decisions. By way of background, my name is Anthony Shilapati, and I'm the president and CEO of Veritas, which is an independent equity research firm based in Toronto, Canada. And I'm proud to say celebrating this year will be 22 years being 100% employee owned and operated. Just a quick disclaimer, this broadcast is not to be taken as investment advice and participants and or employees of the Veritas group of companies may own securities discussed in this broadcast. While we love all our guests and Stephen Polos, of course, in particular, this session may contain forward-looking statements, investment opinions, and comments that we may or may not agree with at all. Now, I could go on for a long time to give you the background uh, of Mr. Polos, but I think I'm going to focus on just giving you a brief summary of, of the history, 100% Canadian, um, and he's actually taught also at the University of Western Ontario, Concordia University, and Queen's University. Um, he studied uh, at uh, Western, did his PhD uh, also at Western, and has a master's in economics from Queen's, and an honors BA, uh, where was that? That was also at Queen's, in English and French, which I'm sure helped uh, during your career. Um, he spent, uh, he started out actually in research, which I, which I found very intriguing. He, he was an analyst at uh, BCA Research as an economist, and um, then spent 14 years uh, at the Export Development Canada as chief economist, head of lending, and finally as president and CEO uh, between 2011 and 2013. Um, and then um, he also spent, spent 14 years um, in various um, roles, uh, ending with uh, being Bank of, of, of Governor of the Bank of Canada for seven years after he spent 14 years during 81 to 95, occupying a range of increasingly senior positions uh, within the government. And we're going to touch on it today, but uh, I'm going to give a big plug here. If you haven't kept, gotten it yet, uh, the next stage of uncertainty, how the world can adapt to a riskier future, um, touches on many of the powerful forces and um, both, both here in North America and globally uh, that will drive our future. So it's a great book um, to get a copy of. Stephen, thanks for joining us. Well, it's nice to be here, Anthony. Thanks. So I always like to start out uh, with all our guests um, for you to give me just give us your background. Why is it, you know, you started out as an economist, were you thinking some 30 plus years ago that you were going to end up being the governor of the Bank of Canada? <laughs> well, for me, Anthony, economics was a happy accident. Uh, I went to Queens to become a doctor and uh, had, took economics as my option, and it just something I fell in love with right away. So back in 1974, if you can believe that, that's when I first learned what, what it is the Bank of Canada does and, and why. And it was at that time I chose to be governor as my vision, my long-term vision, and that's a lot more than 30 or so years ago if you do the arithmetic. So uh, at the end of my undergrad at Queen's in 78, I got a summer job at the Bank of Canada, which was another happy accident. And after that experience, the die really was cast. Um, I was driven to that throughout my, my career as I moved around. You mentioned a couple of the places I've been, but everywhere I went, I kind of had in my mind, will this experience add something to my candidacy as governor someday? Um, you know, the, the time at Export Development Canada in particularly was particularly valuable because I spent all my time with real decision makers in the real economy. And I think it gave me a sense of a much more concrete feel for how the economy works, not less abstract, less model-y. Uh, and so uh, when I came to the governor's job, I actually did it differently, I think, than others. It was much more fact-based, as you like to say, or if you like, less abstract. It was, it was more about what's going on in the real world, and I'd just call people. 
and, and ask them what was going on instead of making it up from models. So from a very young age, you had in mind, I'm going to be the governor of the Bank of Canada. That's right. Yeah, 1974. I was a pretty young age, all right. I was, I guess I was around 19 years old. That's amazing. Who was the governor of the Bank of Canada then? I, I, I can't, I can't recall. Uh, 1974, that was uh, Jerry Bowie was, uh, was the uh, governor. So let's fast forward to your time as governor. And, and I would agree if I can comment that. Um, you, in many speeches, you, you would speak about how the people are feeling and that what they were actually enduring during your time period, because you, you, you went through the time of, you know, when oil crashed, it didn't crash as much as during, during COVID, of course, but, but you had that, that big correction in 14, 15. Um, maybe you can talk to us about when your time as, as governor, what do you remember most of that? You know, I think uh, maybe what, uh, what was most memorable in those early years, so your first couple of years was, and it was something that lasted, it was the strain of communications. Um, you know, I don't know if you, you've watched me do things before, probably you have, and you know, I like to talk. I like to explain things to people, get my hands up in the air, you know, mm -hmm. uh, explain it over and over, more like a teacher. Um, and to me, explaining things to people means, usually it means saying the same thing in more than one way, maybe using a metaphor or something to help people grab it, you know, that kind of thing. And I can tell you that markets don't really like that. Uh, what they like is that you say exactly the same thing every time you say something and don't even move a syllable, let alone uh, add some different concept uh, to the explanation. Uh, and the pressure of responsibility uh, as you go through this of every word or sentence being heavily scrutinized uh, would, uh, would, would make it a tough job. Uh, it is a tough job, but at the same, same time, the fact that every action and every word matters so much is really rewarding. And that sense of, uh, you know, of, of uh, responsibility has a pressure to it, but it's, but it really feels like it matters. So it's, uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. It was a great experience. Is there anything you regret uh, of your time being there? Oh, that's, that's a tough one. Uh, I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean no doubt, uh, if, if you walk through history again, uh, of course, you do that with the benefit of perfect hindsight. There might be lots of things you would regret or wish you had done a little differently, but I actually don't think about it that way. Uh, I guess if there's one thing I would regret, it would be that I, I, even though I tried, I know I spent a lot less time with, with bank staff, like with the regular folks who are doing the everyday work at the bank, you know, as, as a leadership uh, model, I tried to walk around a fair bit, you know, just to be visible rather than staying in my part of the building. Um, but when you're traveling around half the time and in meetings, I guess the other half of the time, that only leaves about 25 or 30 percent of your time uh, to wander the floors, if you get my meaning. Yep. If you're working, working around 150 percent of the time, then, you know, there's a little bit of time for walking the floors. Uh, but I can tell you that some of those random collisions with, with people have been truly precious. Like you just remember them like yesterday. Uh, you can't get to know 1,500 people. They all know who you are. And the office itself is, I'm sure, quite intimidating. I remember it was intimidated by the governor when I was a kid at the bank back in the early 80s. And not because uh, uh, Jerry Bowie was an intimidating person or John Crow, or any of these. I just found uh, the office was intimidating. Uh, so when I met somebody, I would always just say, hey, hi, how are you? Where do you work? You know, is it fun working there? That sort of thing. They would just immediately come back with wonderful things like, gosh, uh, thanks for talking to me. And oh, uh, you're doing a great job or I really like working for you or, you know, stuff like this is so precious. If you never engage with them, you never hear that stuff. So anyway, I, I, met, I think I should have done that a lot more than I did, but I did it as much as I could. So that's my regret. But that, but that sounds like almost a strength. It sounds like, and, and, and as I said, I think it came through and when you were giving your speeches is that you were speaking to the people, you were 
among the people, not just aloof uh, in, 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 as being governor. Yeah, that's always been my way to talk plainly. And uh, of course, I come from a very, uh, let's say, ordinary background, uh, you know, with, uh, with very little extra, I can tell you that. And so I've always kind of identified with the folks that uh, do the hard work and, uh, and not just do hard work, but, but they actually suffer the most when things don't go right, you know, in the economy. I, off, I hear sometimes that uh, I've heard I've heard people say to me actually directly, you know, we need a good recession in the economy because that would really cleanse things, you know, would get rid of the the zombie companies and the deadwood, you know. Only the very richest people actually think that way, <laughs> you know, because it's not them that would uh, pay the price of such a cleansing operation. And I figure if there's a zombie company out there somewhere. It's their bank's job to do the cleansing of the dead wood. And certainly you don't have to have a recession in the economy to get rid of dead wood. Interesting. I think that'll transition nicely to, uh, to what we can talk about next. And obviously here we are um, and at a very interesting time, it's always interesting for lack of a better word, yeah. uh, but all central bankers are, are faced with a very challenging uh, ride, right? right. Yes. So, and I know you talk about this in your book. So, so I, we'll, we'll take this sort of in the direction that you feel works easiest. But if, when you look at, and I, I like the title, right? The next stage of uncertainty. Um, we're faced with so many of them: globalization, inflation, uh, and 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 of course uh, housing, which is really uh, something here in Canada. So maybe we can start with uh, your views that you see here in the current economic situation and uh, how that um, how that will play out going forward. Sure. Um, you know, so you're right. Uh, my, my book's called The Next Age of Uncertainty. That's that's giving uh, giving credit to John Kenneth Galbraith, uh, who wrote so long ago. I don't know if you've ever uh, read his book from the late 70s, The Age of Uncertainty. Mm -hmm. And it was written at a time when economics was kind of uh, really almost falling apart. It really didn't have the ability to explain, uh, given the models that economists were using at the time, couldn't even explain what was happening in the 1970s, let alone forecasting. Uh, and so in the late 70s, when I was going to grad school, economics was being rewritten, you know, in a whole new way, different models. Uh, uh, different interpretations of what's what's going on out there. And so uh, that was a very fertile time. And uh, I, I just think that the, many of the forces that were causing the 70s to be like that are actually coming back to the front, front stage again. Now, one of the most important ones is demographics. You know, in the early 70s, a lot of folks like me were coming onto the workforce. These are the baby boomers. Well, those baby boomers are all exiting now. And over the next five to 10 years, they'll all fall out of the workforce. And that's a global phenomenon. Well, that's been a pretty quiet force for 50 years. You might think for the 50 years, that's normal. And what I'm arguing is no, actually, what we're gonna go back to normal after 50 years of unusual, unusually high growth in the workforce. And that has some pretty profound implications for the outlook, such as slower economic growth, continued low real rates of interest. These are things that most people think, well, things are gonna quieten down in the future. And I don't think they will because that force will interact with other forces like technological progress. Uh, the fourth industrial revolution is underway now and the next 10 years could be very profound. At least 15% of global workers will be impacted by digitization of jobs, uh, maybe more. And while that happens, inequality, which is already pretty high, uh, there's a lot more inequality in the world than there was even 10 years ago. Well, industrial revolutions always really accentuate inequality because people lose their jobs. And of course, the companies that invent the technology or embrace the new technology, they make out like bandits. And so you get this widening out of the income distribution. And debt, I don't have to tell you, debt, you know, has never been higher. It's, it's, it's higher than it was at the end of World War II, government debt. Um, and if that isn't complex enough, we're, we're, we decided, well, we're going to lay overlay on top of that 
the need to converge on net zero or carbon neutrality by 2050. That huge transition in the way we run our economies between now and 30 years from now. So all those things can interact and give us a lot of uncertainty that's so profound. It's like earthquakes. You know what I mean? Like things are happening beneath the surface. You know it, you know it intellectually. Uh, but then every once in a while, everything erupts because the things collide and 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 magnify each other. And that's the, the image that I'm trying to convey uh, to people. Economists think of the economy like a bobblehead doll. It'll, it'll settle down if you leave it alone. You know, well, I don't think so. It'd be like driving around in your car with a bobblehead doll on the dashboard, hoping it will settle down. I, I really don't think it will, given those underlying fundamentals. So if you take the current situation, um, you know, people are looking, we thought things would settle down after COVID. Well, COVID's not even that far behind us yet. We're just about fully recovered from it economically. Uh, but uh, but the, the transition to getting there took enough time that, remember when we shut down the economy, Anthony, there was like 20% of the economy basically shut down. Yep. But only for a short time. You know, by September or so of 2020, we were running at about 98% of where we'd started. And this was missed by people. People heard on the news all about how bad it was in the economy, but that was the 2% that were really, truly suffering. But the 98% was growing and creating new jobs and attracting people from the 2%. Mm -hmm. So then when we began to reopen, finally, the 2%, well, we saw, what we discover is there's a shortage of workers. And so we've got pockets of inflation risk now that are pretty significant. And then, of course, just when we thought we were there, uh, you know, this lunacy that's emerged in Ukraine uh, has pumped up commodity markets tremendously and layered on a whole other shock of, of inflationary pressure on the global economy. It's a very complex situation. It's, it's very hard for central banks to deal with. There are no good paths forward. I think the most likely path is a, I shouldn't say prolonged, but a period, a significant period of what we will call stagflation, slower economic growth, but elevated inflation that's gradually coming down. And so we have to manage it in such a way that it doesn't infect labor markets and become a permanent uh, inflationary boom. Uh, that's a very tricky thing to do. Uh, I'm confident that it can be done. It still can be done without a recession, I think. Really? But right. there's the odds of a recession, of course, are rising, as, as many people have said. So let's, you know, there's a lot of things you, you, you spoke about there. Um, but I, I tried to make some notes here. Demographics, that's, we're, we're seeing the baby boomers fall out. That should be, if we just take that by itself, isn't that good for the millennials, the next, the next sort of, um, uh, you know, job force to be able to fill those roles? And yeah. is there is there now too few? Is that why we're seeing too few uh, employees? Is that yeah. is it, has it just that switch so quickly um, that many of the baby boomers have decided, look, I'm going to leave the in, the market, and now we just have fewer workers because of the de the simple demographics. Well, there's there's more than one thing happening at once, but you're right about that one. So the trend is towards retirement. I mean, I'm retired. I'm still doing some things, but you know, I was born in the mid '50s. Uh, so there's another 10 years of people behind me that are considered to be part of the baby boom generation. So for the next 10 years, what we'll see is a steady retirement wave, you know, of those people. And what it means at the global level and, uh, is that the, the growth in the labor force will continuously decline. Mm -hmm. And that's your most important ingredient of economic growth. So that's a really important thing. Individual countries like Canada can resist that downtrend by having higher levels of immigration. Right. But lots of people, what the other countries are gonna come to the same realization. I think they'll be competing hard to get immigrants to come to their countries uh, soon. For us, our biggest attraction, I think, is our university system. Uh, and of course, that just means now is the right time to invest more in our universities, not less, because that's a really big attractor. 
But anyway, that's a side, a side issue uh, for other policymakers. I just think that uh, even if we have a good immigration level, that only can give us like 1% economic growth. That's not very much. Um, and so uh, we've got to work harder to get higher productivity and generate higher growth here in Canada. And it means interest rates will stay low too. Uh, they may, we're gonna have a bump in interest rates, of course, that's a cyclical thing. Uh, but once that's over, uh, the trend will be to, to low real interest rates, uh, you know, inflation adjusted interest rates. And a lot of people, you know, I don't think they're really expecting this, Anthony. I think that this is a kind of contrary and the idea that things will settle down. I think that's the mistake, too. I think volatility will actually be on a rising trend as these as these uh, forces gather strength. So the, the fourth industrial revolution is really just getting started. Yep. Um, you know, uh, in, you know, the inequality stresses, those inequality stresses, that's what we see when people uh, feel left out, right? They, they vote for Donald Trump or, or Boris Johnson or whatever. And so you kind of get, get these uh, kind of unusual political outcomes and therefore politics becomes more and more polarized because politicians would like to tap into that vein of discontent and say, well, I'll try to do something about that. It's perfectly natural. But what it means, though, is that uh, it makes it harder and harder for po politicians to actually deliver because the, po the polarization gets wider and wider. Uh, and I think that's, that's a trend that will continue as a result of that uh, the rising in income inequality. You know, we talked about this in our preliminary call and it's something that even we've had David Dodge, of course, your predecessor uh, on on pre uh, previously. Right. Um, but this this issue of inequality, the polarization, and there's now even a backlash against central bankers. There's this groundswell of, if I can call it anger or frustration. I I, I think it stems for a lot from ignorance, but maybe I'm a little biased. But th th there's um, th this is this is growing, and so. Right. How do we, how does this get calmed down? Like how do, because th these are the forces that drive people to spend, that drive people to stay living in a certain city, in a certain country, et cetera. Yeah, well, that, that is a that is a good question. Um, well, I, well, maybe a little context around it. I think maybe if we go back to the global financial crisis, which is now uh, almost fifteen years ago. Um, uh, I think the central banks were kind of cast as the saviors, you know, after that. And I think maybe in people's minds, they kind of got used to the idea that central banks could fix almost anything. And then along came COVID, right? And so actually central banks did very little. I mean, we, <laughs> you know, we have really, because interest rates were already close to zero. So you really only, all you do is make interest rates go to zero as low as they could go. You brought out your other weapons, but those weapons are really meant to stabilize markets and make sure everything functions. The really powerful tool was the government uh, fiscal spending. And so, uh, but I think there's still this lingering idea that actually, well, central banks have shown in the past they can fix stuff. So surely they'll fix this. And if they haven't fixed this, it's time to criticize. Them. You know, like even if it's beyond their control. So, you know, double the price or triple the price of oil, there's nothing as any central bank can do about this. Okay. And, and of course, it causes inflation to surge in every country. Uh, it's not the only thing that's going on, but it's the most important thing. And, um, and so people just look at the inflation print and they're like, oh, well, central banks are in charge of that, you know, that. They should, they should be fixing that. And then, of course, it's natural for them to. And then if the central bank says, well, wait a minute, I, I can't control the price of oil, but I'm doing my best on all these other things. It sounds a bit like, you know, uh, a bit of an abstract kind of response, you know, to people. Inflation is high and that's it and that's all. So um, it is a difficult time to be a central banker, uh, for sure. The burden is on helping people understand what is actually going on what actually can be done about it, and then helping people exercise patience as we work our way through that. I, I, I know, for example, I think oil prices probably have peaked. That doesn't mean they'll go down much, uh, but 
they probably have stopped rising. And if that's the case, then inflation will probably begin very soon to drift down. So every month we'll get a little lower inflation reading. And um, hopefully people will give the central banks credit for that, even though that won't be true either. You know, but it'll, they'll kind of soften the tone a little if inflation can, begins to, to head down. If the trend is better, right? But, but you, you, you said earlier, this is not the time to be driving in the car, hoping that the bobblehead is going gonna, is gonna to stop on its own. We have right. to grab hold of the, of the, let's call it to use your car driving. We have to grab hold of the, of the steering wheel, you know, put, put our, you know, at six and nine, at nine and three and grab hold and be careful with the brakes and the, you know, and manage through this. So what is it? And if I can, I'm going to ask it this way and you, you'll answer it the way you think you can. It, let's, let's put it down that you are now central banker. What can you? What can they do? Because you said that's right. They can't fix the central banker. Can't fix the price of oil tomorrow. They no. can't fix inflation tomorrow. Right. Um, there's just so many moving parts, which many of them you've touched on. So, yeah. what is it that that you think? Like, whether it's central bankers, maybe broaden it. What do you think we need to do here as a as Canada, especially? And I want to focus on Canada because I, I really think you know we have so many problems of not being able to get our natural resources out, productivity issues, uh, yeah. you know, we could go on. We spoke about them before. Yeah. So um, how about we touch on that? Okay. So uh, of course, a central bank, a former central banker has a, has a code. Uh, you know, we don't mow the new central bankers uh, lawn for them, right? We, 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 we let them cut their own grass. Uh, so I wouldn't be specific, but let me just describe what is what, what, what is is trying to happen. Uh, much of the inflation that we're seeing is what I'll call external inflation. Nothing we can do about it. But the concern is a real one. The concern is that that inflation, even though it's, it's transitory, and there's the T word for you, Anthony. It really is transitory. You can't say transitory because yes, it's can. really hard. <laughs> I'm not a central banker anymore. <laughs> So I can say transitory because the sense in which we mean that is that it will go away by itself. You know, if oil prices stay at $120, you know, a year, a year after that, inflation will settle down, even though oil prices yes. stay up. That's just a Correct. Okay. So, but the question is, in the interim, does that higher price of oil infect the domestic inflation process? Yeah. and cause domestic inflation to bump up. That's what we call de-anchoring of expectations. So right now, what the central banks are trying to do is, is, is go in the middle, right? To try, try to raise interest rates and do QT and, and demonstrate that they're on, on the job uh, to make sure that expectations stay anchored and therefore that inflation, which will end up being transitory, does not get embedded in the domestic process. And if they can do that by, as Jay Powell has said, his main objective is to reduce the number of excess job vacancies in the economy. That's a good measure of how much extra demand there is, you know, excess demand there is in the economy. And we have a million vacant jobs here in Canada. Uh, well, that's obviously really hot. That's a hot labor market. So that's going to be prone to having higher wages and and all that maybe can cause future inflation. So you got to tighten enough to reduce the excess demand. And you should be able to do this without having a recession if, if expectations remain well anchored. So that's kind of the, the balance is trying to be struck. And as I've argued, it means slowing the economy down, getting some, some less de excess demand in it, while inflation is still rumbling through, you know, the external inflation is still rumbling through. Well, that's stagflation. That's what everybody's going to call it. And it's a fair term. Uh, but stagflation is probably the best that we can hope for now. Stagflation without a recession is about the best that we can hope for right now. And so as investors, we need to think, okay, what does stagflation do to markets? You know, which, which stocks are going to do okay in that setting? Uh, which ones won't, you know, interest rates with the risk of going higher. Okay, got to understand that. Does that make me prefer dividend stocks, you know, utilities, that kind of thing? Maybe. Does it, does it cause me to wait, wait a little while before going back to growth? growth? Yes, it does. So you kind of have those kinds of, 
uh, themes in your investment. I think though, the bigger picture is that those forces we talked about earlier are still mashing together. And even when this up, this bump in the road is taken care of, there's gonna be a lot more volatility for us to deal with. And I think that's gonna mean it's a stock picker's world again. We're going back, we're going back to the 50s and 60s when your, your uncle Bob or somebody was your, your best advisor on which stocks to pick. Not the thematic or the indexing or any of that stuff. I think in this new world where, there, where risk is the most important thing and managing risk will be the most important occupation of companies, Okay, you're going to need to understand those companies, which ones have resilience, which ones are going to be able to manage the risk, and those are the ones to invest in. And that's going to, that's going to take some homework, yeah? not, not an index. And I think an indexed approach is going to be a, a recipe for bad performance. You know, it, 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 I couldn't have teed this up better. Eh? I, I, I really appreciate this whole conversation because we are all about stock picking, all about fundamental research. I think that passive investing are there. These are funds that are not unmanaged portfolios, because if you if you if you just you know, if you're just riding a wave or a factor or whatever, then right. it's not being managed. That's in right. any event, so that, that, that was very interesting. I'm going to just uh, remind our audience here, um, if anyone has a question, hover over the bottom of your page. We have a QA and a little uh, icon. Uh, type in your question, and I'll try my best here to make sure that, uh, that Stephen addresses it. Um, you know, I, I, I wanted to touch on, uh, continue to touch on this, th these points, because um, the job vacancies to me is very interesting, mm -hmm. because... If we go back um, over the last couple of decades, you know, we have had the, the inflation rate in wages minuscule. Now, inflation has generally been minuscule, but wage inflation in particular has been low. Yeah. So we could say that's been globalization, that, you know, we've exported away our inflation. Maybe that yeah. is something you believe you agree or not. Yeah. Now, where we are, so then we had COVID. And all of a sudden, um, we had, you know, we gave money to people, they sat at home. Now there's all these jobs available. Where did these people go? Like, they were working before. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, there's jobs. And it's not just Canada. I just came back from England. I'm on an advisory board to the International Accounting Standards Board. And in England, they have tons of job vacancies. And yeah. yet, that no one understands why. Spain yeah. is the same thing. So maybe you can talk to this. Yeah, well, I, I, I alluded to that in our, in our first uh, question uh, in the current situation. And here, here's the thing. People forgot that hardly any of the economy got shut down. At first, we thought we were shutting the whole thing down. We literally thought, let's, let's just stop the clock. And then maybe six months from now, we can start the clock again. Well, it turns out stop, stopping an economy and then just restarting it sounds really easy, but it's, it is not. And especially when it, well, the time is much more than six months, okay? So it was a much longer time. The, wor the world did not sit still. And most importantly, like I said, by September of 2020, we were riding at about 98% of where we started. So all the damage was mostly in that 2 or 3% of the economy. So people, you know, they were shut down. They were they were, they were on CERB, of course. Uh, there was others that were on uh, wage subsidies, that kind of thing. Well, that's all well and good. But in the 98% of the economy, jobs like accountants and engineers and IT people and lawyers and medical practitioners and personal, uh, personal workers and so on were, were growing really rapidly. And so what happened was a lot of folks that were, you know, shut down were able to gravitate into the 98% of economy where the jobs were being created. Now we reopen, and be, meanwhile, immigration slowed down to nothing, right? Actual immigration. When they mm -hmm. say there's more immigrants that year, well, those are just people who are already here that became official, okay? So the planes weren't arriving like normal. Uh, and so that's all started up again, which is great news. But the point is that when we, when we did finally reopen the 2%, there, there were very few people left sitting there waiting for a job. 
And so what we've got is access demand for labor. Now, if we're, if we're lucky, you know, construction workers, uh, all kinds of uh, huge vacancies out there, it's a very good chance that the immigrants that are showing up today are gonna be well suited to these jobs. And that will suck up that extra demand, right? You can fill it in with more supply and that'll take some of this pressure off of wages. Now, just to remind you that before the pandemic, wages were rising at about, I think it was around three and a half, maybe closer to 4%. That's a pretty normal growth rate in wages in a 2% inflation economy. That's where we were before the pandemic, 2% inflation, perfectly 2%. Yep. And unemployment was at a 40 year low. You, you know, that's a very healthy starting point to have a major shock hit the economy. You don't want the shock, but that's the best place to start it, right? So we're pretty resilient. And I think that's why we bounced back so fast. You know, we, we just, a lot of economists thought it would be the worst recession since the Great Depression. They literally said that. But we didn't have that. You know, we, we recovered really well. And, uh, and so, well, that's fantastic. We should be cheering for that. And if we did it, did it too well, and now we've got some pockets of inflation pressure because of some supply issues, well, that's okay. It's all good news, but we need to manage it, right? That's a different risk now. But let's not forget that we could have been in the second Great Depression right now. Okay? Let's not forget that. Mm -hmm. A lot of people thought we would be. The fact that we avoided all that and your portfolios are, you know, they're getting damaged this year. But I mean, my goodness, past two years, you, you did pretty well as an investor. And that's because the economy was well resilient and, and well stabilized uh, through all that. So it's, it, is, uh, it, it is a difficult situation. Uh, you're absolutely right. I'm not trying to minimize it. and don't want to make people think I'm making it sound easy because it's not going to be easy. So obviously, and you pointed it out, you know, the, the central bankers are not, you know, they, they can't walk on water. They can't fix any, everything. No, but they can't. Maybe you, could, maybe you could touch on, because we, you know, as, as investors, um, we have a role to play, I think, with, uh, you know, as act, not quite that we have to be activists, but we do get a say. We can speak to management and we do have votes for, um, yeah. uh, you know, directors, et cetera. Can, maybe you can touch on, um, and I got a good question here from the group, from, from the listeners, is uh, who else should be taking action and, and what other types of actions do you suggest? Well, uh, I think you mean in the next age of uncertainty? That's, that's right. really, yes. So, I mean, given what we've just been through uh, with the pandemic, and I think, to, you know, like I just said, I think the, the policymakers did a fabulous job of of stabilizing things for us. I mean, life could have been brutal uh, and, and it wasn't. It was hard for some people, but we had the tools to help them get through. But I think, I think though, that having been through that, a lot of people might think, wow, if, if that happens again, two years from now or five years from now, they'll just do that again. You know, if there's, if there's a volatility that Steve Polaz is predicting in his book, if that comes, surely the governments will just fix it you know, like they did during the pandemic. And right. the answer is, no, I don't think so. And here's why. First of all, central banks, like last time, interest rates are gonna stay low. So there's no, not gonna be room to maneuver for central banks to, to soften the blow of all that volatility. And governments, well, they've got that huge debt legacy from the pandemic. And on top of which, as we age, we become a bigger drag on the medical care system, on the care economy, just on government programs in general. So you have big fiscal drag at the same time as you already start with a lot of debt. So I think governments, plus on top of that, the politics we mentioned before, you might think, oh, well, they'll just magically come up with new policies. Well, not if politicians can't agree on anything, right? So that if the polarization it continues to grow, people just won't be able to decide this stuff. And so I'm skeptical that, that everything's gonna get taken care of. And so that leaves it up to individuals and their companies to manage the risks that I'm talking about. I think it's mostly about companies. Everybody be more conservative. Households won't buy the biggest house that the bank will let them buy. They'll, they'll, they'll hold some capacity and reserve because it's much more likely that they'll lose their job for six months or nine months. You could lose your house in a period like that, right? And so you wanna make sure you've got some buffering 
as a company, I think you're going to manage risks much more professionally. You actually invest real money and have people whose job it is just to manage your risk for you. And I think in the labor market, the power is all shifting to the worker. The companies will, first of all, there's a shortage of workers because of the aging. And you mentioned before, maybe this is kind of good. We got this, uh, we got we're gonna have shortage, shortage of workers at just the time when we want the millennials to be able to get jobs. Well, they'll have, they'll have their jobs and there'll still be a shortage of workers, I assure you. So huge disruptions coming. And so I think companies are gonna to have to do a lot to retain and, re and attract people. Otherwise they just won't get the job done. And that means they're gonna they're gonna do things like you know they're gonna have they're gonna bring DB plans back maybe right because that's uh, that reduces lifetime risk for their employees right gives them a sense of comfort about the future um, you know they're 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 gonna they're gonna be simulating uh, scenarios all the time because economics is based on the bell curve right that's the most likely outcome there that that's how you manage your business not anymore going to be a spread of possible outcomes and you're going to have to keep understanding how you will deal with any one of those outcomes not just that main one uh, there's a lot of different behavior there and you're going to look for companies that can do this well they do it well two two uh, cycles in a row you'll know you've got a winner and by the way the good risk managers will take out the bad risk managers right i mean because the bad risk manager is just going to look all stressed because I don't know, inflation's up, interest rates are up, they've got too much debt. There'll be all these kind of symptoms of stress. And the company that manages those risks better has more resilience or buffering. They'll be able to take out those weaker players. So there, there's that's your investment theme, I think, in this age, next next stage of uncertainty. And, and I think it's interesting, you know, you've talked about how uh, you know, we need to deal with that, that people talk, we need to deal with zombie companies in an environment that you're speaking about, if I can interpret it, you see that it, these zombie companies, if we can call it, I call it companies that don't generate cash, don't have yeah. pricing power, don't have competitive advantage. These right. companies are going to fall by the wayside. Yeah, I would expect that uh, the stresses will be immediately visible in a zombie company that doesn't have any buffering or you know, it's not actually creating much value, um, you know, and it, it shouldn't be up to policymakers to force zombie companies out of business somehow. I think their lender should, you know, their lender should just say, you know, look, you know, you're, you're not going to make it through the next cycle. So let's, let's do it order, in an orderly fashion. Let's do it now. All right. It wouldn't be, it wouldn't be complete. I want to, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, but it wouldn't be complete if we didn't talk about housing. Um, and so I, I remember really well, uh, because we've been having our housing conference uh, for now, this is going to be our 10th year. Mm -hmm. And uh, back in 2014, uh, with the supply that was coming on the market set to come in all the condos, and of course, oil price had crashed. And we said, you know what, this like, it looks like housing is painted into a corner, it's going to not, there's no way this is going to work. And then swooped in Mr. Putin and every continued on and it was fine. And so now we're in a tricky situation, right? Because today a five-year mortgage is more than double what it was six months ago. So yep. how much can the central bank raise before we have some type of crisis, if I can call it that, or how do you see this playing out? Yeah. So you have to bear in mind that, uh, when when, an, when a central bank cuts rates to zero or near zero, ask yourself, what are they trying to do? Mm -hmm. First line, they're just trying to make sure markets continue to function well. That's, and that's basic table stakes. But really, in a macro sense, what they're trying to do is boost spending that depends on lending uh, so that it buffers the downside in the economy. Well, that's housing. So, so, you know, when you cut interest rates to zero, what you're really trying to do is boost housing. Well, it worked. <laughs> okay. And so you boost housing, why? To fill in the gap that other spending is leaving, leaving empty, right? And so when you move interest rates back to normal, what happens? Housing slows down. 
it's you know it's not not really that complicated it just but the question is when that's not if that was the only thing that was happening we might understand it better but what's happening at the same time is immigration so immigration is going to be like 440 or 450,000 this year um, and you know we're not building houses at more than around 200,000 you know, or homes, I should say, dwellings, yeah. it's dwellings. not just houses. And so, uh, of course, some of those, those are people with kids and so on. So we don't need 400,000 houses. But but the point is, we have this, this kind of puts a bottom under the housing market if you're going to have those levels of immigration uh, continuing into the future. So uh, that makes it really hard. I think that uh, all of our cities, our major cities, are going to continue to grow in scale because of immigration levels, that's our plan. We're gonna stick with that plan. Uh, even if we build exactly the right number of new uh, dwellings for each of these uh, new arrivals, as the city gets bigger, the price curve for the city looks like the Eiffel Tower, right? Low at the edges, high in the middle. And uh, the bigger the base, the higher the tower. That's true for every city in the world. Take, take two cities, one that's twice as big as the other, it costs twice as much in the middle of the bigger one. That's just the way it is, okay? So, because why? Because it's time, time is money. It takes you that long to get downtown or whatever. You're willing to pay more to live closer. So that that is not gonna change. And so I think that housing will remain a critical issue for us uh, going forward. Uh, we're gonna need maybe more financial innovation in order to help people deal with the risks around housing. Perhaps, you know, more of the kind of rent to own or co-ownership type of models that are emerging. Uh, maybe we'll look at uh, longer range uh, mortgages, perhaps, you know, look at that as a solution. I don't really know where all that's going to go, but I think I think in the end, uh, we're, it's going to be at a lower level than what we've seen. And that could come in the form of lower prices. So I have to have to admit that uh, in the near term. But I believe in the floor, the floor under housing because of the immigration level. I think that's the most important thing people need to bear in mind. I mean, I remember back back in 1990 when you know we had we had housings correct. Well, you look at a chart, you can hardly find that thing now in the chart, right? And I mean, you know, I'm sure it was traumatic for especially for some folks in Vancouver at the time, but the vast majority of Canadians, um, you know, they buy their home to live in it not as a speculative thing. And, uh, and so uh, I'm expecting that this, you know, whatever we go through here, it'll be a bump in the road and, and that those fundamentals will reassert themselves positively uh, looking is, forward. Is there something that makes you nervous about that? About that well, uh, potential to, you know, that things be smooth? Yeah, I mean, what 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 makes me nervous is that right now there's enough uncertainty, and we, obviously I, I believe the uncertainty is profound, and so it's easy to make mistakes in this situation. You know, we we like to think that you know you look out the window and you see the housing market has already rolled over, even though interest rates have only gone up a little bit so far. But you say like a five year rate has you know gone up a couple of points, uh, so obviously that's already having an impact. Something people are underestimating is when you're paying twice as much to fill your gas tank once or twice a week, that takes purchasing power from every other aspect of the economy. People are underestimating the, the power of this. That's worth many rate, rate hikes in terms of its effect on the economy. And it affects everything, not just housing or investment. So I think there's a slowdown coming just because of that, even if central banks weren't adjusting interest rates. And I think people are also underestimating the power of QT. Mm -hmm. I mean, some, a lot of people, I say a lot, but a lot of people seem to think that QE is an important reason why inflation is higher. Well, if they, I don't really believe that, but let's suppose enough people believe it, point is that QT should satisfy or or, or you know, reassure people who are worried about QE, its use. So QT will should should reduce those those concerns among people. So for all these reasons, I think uh, inflation is going to come under control faster than most people think. Certainly faster than what markets think. And what you're relying on is central banks figuring it out in real time. You know. 
to not overdo it or what have you. And that's what data dependence looks like. It's a very tough job though, given the uncertain. So I just say, well, let's all hedge our bets. We, we as investors, we should be mentally prepared and our portfolio should be designed to withstand a recession. I'm not predicting one, but there could easily be one. Stagflation, which I mentioned before, and a continued inflation. I don't think that's that's very likely. I think stagflation is the most likely path forward, but I think we need to prepare for all those scenarios as investors. Um, I'm going to just quickly launch our uh, poll here so everybody can tell us what a great job you've done. <laughs> and and uh, no, it's, it, it's been a wonderful discussion. I, I love how we're touching on so many things at once. And, and I hope people are listening in or realizing just how it's not just, okay, you know, if we just tweak this, then everything's going to fall into place. Like yeah. everything is interrelated. Yeah. And, and, um, and it's great. You've pr provided a great uh, uh, perspective on that. I got a good question here uh, from, from someone listening about um, global food security, current and future role of supply side inflation. You can put that in context because um, we're seeing obviously inflation's affecting food shortages and supply. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this is critical. You touched on the impact, obviously, of re related to commodities and energy specifically. But what about on food supply? Yeah, well, this this course is a big unknown. Um, I think there are many uh, food areas where Ukraine's a really important supplier, and on top of which, the food chain, which includes fertilizer, fertilizer is in short supply and of course expensive. So you're gonna, and of course we know energy is expensive. So if you, you know, obviously use a lot of energy in the production of food. So for all those reasons, whether there's a shortfall, a literal shortfall, looks like there will be, but even if there isn't, there's gonna be a how much higher price just to feed ourselves in the tripod of existence, you know, food, water, and energy. That's, that's a, that can be a fragile thing. Uh, so, uh, and highly disruptive. And so, well, I mean, if you're asking as an investor, well, I think, you know, the commodity, some of those commodities look like they're going to stay high for, until we get more clarity on what this Ukraine situation looks like. Uh, we're seeing a rollover in the cyclically dependent commodities like copper and base metals. Yeah. That's just because the, the market's already sniffing out that the slowdown already looks like it's already occurring. Uh, we don't have to wait for interest rates to bite for it to happen. It's already happening. And the question now is just how deep is it? Um, and I think, you know, the central banks still have, as a group, they still have the ability to find their way through this just by eliminating excess demand as opposed to creating excess supply. That's usual recipe for reducing inflation is excess supply. But you know, if most of the inflation is coming from oil prices and you can't do anything about it, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to cause deflation in the rest of the economy to offset the inflation coming from oil. You may have seen a thing by, there was one of the deputy governors at the Bank of England gave a speech two or three weeks ago, and he provided simulations. The Bank of England's super transparent on this stuff. They simulated if they raised interest rates exactly like the market is predicting they will, uh, the Bank of England models show that inflation will fall to just over 1% over the next two years. Well, I'd say, well, that just tells you, by according to their models, that the market is thinking they're gonna tighten too much, right? That's, that's what that's saying. Uh, they also simulated, what if we just hold interest rates where they are and inflation would be well above 2%, right, like closer to 3%. So it just shows you that, roughly speaking, somewhere between what the market thinks and the status quo is probably where the Bank of England will, will end up. Well, that's that's useful to understand as a benchmark, but that assumes we know what, what's happening. You know, the uncertainty around uh, what we're really seeing and how much will people cut back because their sentiment is reduced, their confidence is lower, how much because just because it's costing so much for their gas for their car, all those things are just unknowns. How sensitive is the economy to interest rates today, given how high debts are? We don't know the answer to that without trying. And that's why data dependence is so important and why a certain amount of gradualism is still likely. 
it's interesting, you know, the central bankers, when I, I, I've done some reading back at the time of the 80s and 70s, just to really understand, right? And so we get nervous here about 75 basis points or 100 basis points. In the 80s, Volcker would be like 400 basis points, 450 the next quarter. <laughs> Um, yeah, well, even 94, uh, you know, uh, that was a pretty big uh, hit to the bond market sure. in 94. And that's when inflation was already pretty well down to like 3%. So uh, we, we all that just to tell you that it depends on expectations. Back in 1981, Volcker, what he would face was expectations were probably running at 10% inflation. If anybody's expecting 10% inflation today, well, I think they're gonna they're gonna they're gonna misjudge the situation. Okay. I think it's possible that inflation would settle out at say three to three and a half percent at the most after the oil price shock st stabilizes, let's say. Right. Well, okay, three percent inflation, that's not good because it's not it's above two percent, but it's not much compared to having the second great depression. Right. Right. It's like as, as Picard uh, on Star Trek, you know, he never argues with Jordy about how many photon torpedoes they should use. Right. He just says, load the photon torpedoes and then they launch them you know, to get the job done. Right. And and then they mop up afterwards. And that's the same thing with a firefighter that puts out the fire. After it's out, then they mop up the water. And that's what too that, much water. Nobody, nobody asks if you use too much water. So long as no, the no, no, certainly they're not critical. They don't criticize because, but, but it's still your job to mop it up, right? Afterwards, and we are at that stage where central banks are doing exactly that. And uh, I think uh, there's every reason to think that they'll do it very well. The problem is, if I can use your firefighting analogy. While they're spraying, while you spray the water, you can also damage the the you know what is not burning, right? And so, yeah. like, there's because there's so much debt in today's market, household debt, commercial debt, government debt. Yeah. We're we're tipping on a number of things that that need to find the balance. Using your bobblehead analogy, I love it. Yeah, you're absolutely right about that. And so there can be side effects, which are really important. And they may even be representative of fragilities, right? To give you a secondary earthquake, if you like. Yeah. Um, and so we have to beware of those risks for sure. And no one, no one's perfect. As I said, it's easy to make a mistake in such an uncertain situation. All right, I'm gonna leave you with uh, two quick questions uh, that we ask all our guests. Uh, okay. your, your favorite book. Oh, my favorite book. You mean a serious book or, or a good book? You okay. can like, give me one of each, whatever you like. My favorite book actually is Dune. Um, that's been my favorite book my whole life. Wow. Um, and of course, the, all the offspring. And uh, but as as in terms of a uh, what I call hard book, a nonfiction book, Guns, Germs, and Steel. That's that's uh, to me the classic. It's a very everybody should have a, should have read that book. Of course, I haven't mentioned you know the next stage of uncertainty, which by I, which I now, mentioned right at the I mean, beginning. <laughs> that's my that's got to be my favorite book now. But uh, but anyway, no, seriously, Guns, Germs, and Steel, I think, is just such a such a classic book by Jared Jared Diamond. Yeah. And uh, favorite podcast? Oh, well, that's that's a tough question because to be honest, I'm not really a podcaster. Okay. Uh, I, I'm reading is my main thing. I mean, I read and read and read and read, but uh, the idea of sitting and listening, I know lots of people do it. I noticed my, my book sales, the, the, uh, the, uh, the audio book is, is vastly outperforming the ebook. So a lot, they told me that's a growth business for sure. The business you're in uh, podcasting and I, and I, and I, I think it's great. But I'm not one to do it, to be honest. Maybe I'll say this this is my favorite podcast. How's that? I like that. All right. Good. <laughs> well, listen, uh, thanks for your time. Um, we may check in with you uh, at some point in the future to see uh, how your views change as this as we continue to go through this uh, new age of uncertainty. Next age of uncertainty. Next age. Sorry. Next Very age. Important. Anyway, it was my pleasure, Anthony. Uh, you take care out there. Thanks very much. Thanks everyone for watching. Stay strong.